Hey everybody, it is the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman and uh, my friend David Zills, the apologist, is back. How are you doing? I am hanging in there. I had a full two weekends and I'm looking forward to next weekend. It's going to be boring and I'm excited. Ah, this is this is my favorite part about getting old is just how great bored starts to feel. Um, like, Do you remember like when, when you were little, did, was bored just like a really dangerous word to say in your house growing up? Uh, yeah, yeah. And like, then I was going to go, go outside or it was like, my, my parents will find something for me to oh, do. Yeah. Like board was like, I, I, there were some words that you weren't supposed to say as a child, but somehow board actually ranked above all the dirty ones because yeah, that, that was going to get you the most work. It's um, like naps, you know, as a kid, you never like naps and then you get older and you're like, oh, naps are really one of the greatest things ever. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we hate the best things. Um, but so I, I hope you get to be bored, uh, except if you're listening, I, I hope then you get to be entertained and, and, uh, and enlightened. Uh, so I'm talking about- <laughs> I'll try not. I'll try not to be boring. No, it's it's always interesting. And we've been talking about a really interesting one too. We've been sort of picking our way through miracles and, and even into to sort of modern day miracles. And I think we're kind of picking up there. Am I right? Oh, I got you just as you were drinking. So um, that's, that's my timing for you. <laughs> nope. Sorry. Um, yeah. So yeah, modern miracles, you know, we've talked, uh, uh, you know, we, we spent kind of a really dry episode a couple of times ago talking about did miracles happen and can miracles happen. But lately we've been talking about do miracles happen? And if they do, what's their relevance for the historical Jesus? And I've kind of been trying to make the case that these things are actually reported broadly across the world. And even if you look across Christian history down through the centuries, this is, there's a continue, there's a not a continuum. There's there's a continuation between Jesus' miracles, the miracles of the apostles, the church fathers, all the way down to today. And so it shows this consistency. You know, we talked about um, kind of the, the Christian story and tracing it down through the generations of Christians. And however far back you go, all the way back to decades after Jesus' resurrection, you get the same story. Jesus rose from the dead and he's the son of God. And you see the same thing with miracles. Jesus did miracles. The apostles did miracles. There are miracles reported by church fathers and there are miracles reported today. And so this consistency is really reassuring because it kind of shows us, you know, there's there's we can have some confidence that this isn't some weird thing. And, you know, miracles are hard to believe in the Bible until you start hearing that this stuff is happening today. And then it can kind of make you think a little bit. Right. It actually gives a little more credence too, because like we'll, uh, we'll, we'll read Luther, for example, and he'll talk about spiritual warfare. He'll, he'll talk about miracles as if they are commonly occurring. And it's, it's really simple to sort of say, all right, I know you were a brilliant theologian and I'm going to hang on most of your words, but here you're just sort of, you're being weird or you, you're, you're, you didn't have an iPhone to Google this. Um, like there, there's something missing. But what if, what if maybe they were a little closer to it than we were and we're just distracted by all the tech? Yeah, I think there's something too to be said about our culture. There's this, we, we kind of bought into the scientific, you know, going back to this period of history in Europe called the Enlightenment, where these philosophers tried to deconstruct all the supernatural stuff. And there were a lot of things going on that led them to different conclusions. But I think as a culture, we kind of have in the West, the modern West, um, there's kind of this blind spot where anything that's supernatural is like stuff you see in tabloids. It's stuff that, you know, is sensational. But if you dig a little bit, it, it goes away. But if you look through most of history, people didn't have that view. And if you look through most of the world today, you know, Craig Keener, we've been talking about his books, and he makes the case that the majority world is very open to the supernatural and doesn't deconstruct it automatically. You know, it's not that they're gullible, but you, it's almost like we're gullible the other way where we're like so gullible that if someone offers this really, really shoddy um, Excuse. Nat natural explanation, we're like, well, it's got to be that. And when really, you know, it's, th it's pretty clear that it's supernatural. And so biases work both ways, you know, they really do. And so That's kind true. of being aware of, what are my cultural biases? Um, and I'm not saying we should just believe in miracles anytime someone makes a claim. I hope that's been clear. You know, we should test this stuff. You know, we should we should use critical thinking. But part of critical thinking is being open to possibilities while also, you know, weighing them to see what makes the most sense. Right. And that's a little bit of what we're talking about today, too, right? Yeah. So, you know, we've talked a lot about these things are reported around the world. Here are some examples, you know, wow, they're kind of they kind of get your attention, 
but you know, let's let's poke at it a little bit and see, you know, how would you explain this stuff scientifically? Mm-hmm. You know, how how would someone look at this and be like, you know, I, I don't have to invoke God to explain that. There are other ways that that can happen. And I think that's an important step. Um, so yeah, I think we should kind of go through. I think there are probably four main categories of scientific or natural or non-supernatural explanations that we can look at that okay. tend to cover most of what I've read about when I've been researching this. All right. So these are the people who are critical of miracles. And these are sort of the, the common sort of things that they'll, they'll talk about. So they're not all invalid. Let, let, let's, yeah. That is the, that is one of the most important points is um, there are a lot of times where a natural explanation works. There are a lot of times where a natural explanation is actually the best explanation. And so, um, you know, it's not good. It's not good thinking and it's not good witness. It's, I don't think it's what Jesus would have us to do would be to go around and say, well, everything's a miracle. You know, there are a lot of things that aren't, or there are a lot of things that could be, but could not be. And we kind of have to withhold judgment. And so that, that's a really important point is a lot of times natural explanations are valid and we should admit that. Right. And they're not even less godly. It's, it's not as if God is unable to care for his creation in the normal way. Um, that, that still points to his providence. The, the miracles show that, you know, every once in a while, he's, he's willing to sort of bend reality to his merciful will. But at the same time, his, his will is still invoked on creation simply in the normal ways that he cares for it. God's hand is at work through your doctor when you go there when you're sick. God's hand is at work through your parents, through, through all of the places where he has, he has already promised to work. That the sort of debunking of a miracle doesn't debunk God. And that's that's important. Yeah, I think that's that's really important. Um, yeah, uh, you can't use general providence necessarily to make a case for God in the way that you can things where God directly intervenes in a way that you know has to be supernatural. But you know, you don't need everything to be evidence for God. You know, right. Because if you have some evidence for God that convinces you, then, you know, that changes the way you see all of reality and you can, you know, and yeah, providence fits very well within God's character. Absolutely. All right. So four sort of things to, to sort of check out. Yeah. So the first one is probably the, the simplest one. Um, so we, it actually ties back to a couple of times ago, we gave a definition of a miracle where it's an event first criteria that is anomalous. It doesn't just happen. Second criterion. And third, it ha- it's caused by a supernatural agent. And so the three, the three main, there's a fourth one, which is kind of a throw your hands up and in, in faith kind of way. And we'll talk about that. But the three, the, the other three are mainly just debunking each of those criteria. So the first, you know, is it an event? Well, the first objection would be, no, it actually didn't happen. So what do I mean by this? You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens on YouTube and we can't be sure it's real. There's Wait, a lot of, there's, there's we'll just go on the internet and tell lies. <laughs> yeah. Like me right now. No, just kidding. No, but, but I mean, like actually we're saying uh, apply everything that you're learning to this too. See if it holds water. Absolutely. Exactly. No, fact check me, please. I've given, I'm giving you references. You can look them up. Um, yeah. You can see if they're credible sources. Um, that's very important, especially in the internet age. So, yeah. So the first objection is, you know, it's not real, you know, it it could be a fraud, you know, maybe there's a healing preacher that comes in and he puts plants in the audience who pretend to be blind. And he says, you're blind. Oh, Jesus heals you. And then they can magically see, and you're like, oh, that's amazing. But then if you dig a little bit, you find, oh, this is some kind of conspiracy. Um, the other, the other way this can happen is through misunderstanding, Um, So there are some theological systems, which I don't agree with. I don't think they're biblical. I don't think Lutherans would agree with them. But they say that, um, you know, your faith can actually change the outcome. So if you're sick, that's Satan trying to convince you that you're sick, but you've actually been healed in Jesus' resurrection. And so you need to, if you believe hard enough, you'll reverse what appears to be sickness because of Satan's influence. And it's, it's, I've heard this and I, I think it's a little wacky. Um, so we have to kind of look for those cases where someone says they're healed. And then you ask, well, are your symptoms there? Well, yeah, but that's not real. It's like, okay, well, I don't think we're on the same page theologically here. That's, that's, that's quite ungodly. Nobody has faith in faith. We're supposed to have faith in Christ. 
Right. And, and we have to use our theology carefully. You know, when it says Jesus carried our sorrows and bore our infirmities, you know, that doesn't mean that we're actually cured of everything this side of heaven. You know, there's a, an already not yet aspect to the restoration of all things where we are in eternal life, but we still live in brokenness. So the question, though, is, does this explanation that nothing actually happened, you know, does this account for everything, you know, is everything a fraud? Is it some massive conspiracy? And I think that really, I mean, I think common sense, when you look at the amount of the number of cases that people are reporting independently of each other around the world today, the probability of that being some mass conspiracy where these people aren't talking to each other and they're all decided, woke up one day and was like, I'm going to deceive the world and claim a miracle. You know, I think the odds of that are pretty low. So I think it doesn't prove that all of these are real, but I think, you know, I think the fact that this is reported so broadly, we have to take seriously the possibility that in some of the cases, there's something happening, whatever that something is. Mm -hmm. Right. Even just sort of the, the reality, I can say, well, it, it's not snowing today, um, but that doesn't mean that it's never snowing. Um, each of these has to be sort of uh, addressed independently because you're right. Some of the people have lied. Like there, there's no way around this. And, and some of the people were just sort of, they were deceived. They, they were misled or, or um, in, in sort of a, a desire to, to find God in their grilled cheese sandwich. Um, they, they saw something that, that wasn't there, but that doesn't necessarily discount everything. Yeah, that's huge. I think you had a series this summer about logical fallacies, and one of them's all or nothing. Yep. You know, kind of the idea that we have to explain all of these the same way. You know, I know there it's a case by case thing. Different explanations work best in different cases. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think you can use fraud as the blanket coverage. It works in some cases, but it can't cover all these all these. Um, modern day accounts or historical accounts. So the second criterion is um, a little more nuanced. It says something happened, somebody let's say was healed, but it was coincidence. Like it's just statistically, it's gonna happen every now and then. You know, For example, someone gets cured of cancer after prayer. Well, cancer goes into remission naturally. You know, and so how do we know whether this would have happened anyway or whether the prayer actually did anything? And so this is, you know, this is legitimate. This is something to think carefully about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, there's there's sort of a case to be made um, is, again, sort of the idea of a, a providential God and, and coincidence don't always jive. Um, but at the same time, um, just because... You, you, you sort of already believe in God and, and find that he works in, in ways that defy the, the nature of coincidence. If you don't already believe in God, the coincidence isn't going to convince you. Right, exactly. Yeah, so, um, so, so there's actually, this is, I like this one because my background, my PhD was in statistics. It was electrical engineering, but it was basically applied math and statistics. And there's actually ways to tell scientifically if things are coincidences. Um, you can basically say, all right, I know how off the percentage of time things go away automatically or naturally on their own. And then I can look at that statistical distribution, that histogram or whatever, when there's prayer and you can do hypothesis tests that are statistically rigorous that say, you know, is this something that would happen? Do these same, do these, is there the same phenomenon working in both cases or is one of them have some different causal mechanism. Um, and believe it or not, someone's actually done this. I think we've alluded to this. Um, Candy Gunther Brown is an IU researcher who writes um, academic research from not necessarily a faith perspective. She doesn't say what she believes. She doesn't endorse a theological explanation. She, she just reports the facts. She's kind of just a reporter, kind of the, the ideal reporter that reports the facts and doesn't try to put spin on it. Um, so, you know, you can't figure out what she believes in this, but she says, you know, this is just what's happening and I'm trying to do good academic research. And one of the things she does, she applies a number of methods to modern miracles. And one of them is where she actually does kind of a prop 
prospective study where she, she actually flew to Mozambique where Heidi and Roland Baker have a very high success rate reported with, deaf, with healing deafness and blindness. And so they decided to go and kind of measure this and subject it to statistical tests. And so they, they, they went to one of these meetings where you know, there was a lot of prayer for healing. They took standard audiological and visual assessment equipment. That's kind of the, the standard way you measure this. And they did a, you know, very careful before and after measurements, did the statistical tests. And sure enough, in some cases, they got statistically significant results where people were, you know, you know, the before, the before and after were different in a way that couldn't have been by coincidence. So I have this excerpt from, it's actually uh, from Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Miracles, which I highly recommend. It's very accessible. And he interviews Candy Gunther Brown, Dr. Brown in that. And um, in that chapter, he kind of does a, a summary of what happens. And, it, and he says, in all, there were 24 subjects who received prayer. After prayer, we found highly significant improvements in hearing and statistically significant improvements in vision, Brown told Lee Strobel. We saw improvements in almost every single subject we tested. Some of the results were quite dramatic. They had two subjects whose hearing thresholds were reduced by more than 50 decibels. Um, so what's 50 decibels? Um, uh, uh, loud, like after uh, 100 ear protection. 100 decibels is the sound of a nearby motorcycle or like a power lawnmower. Um, 80 decibels is the sound of a garage disposal or garbage disposal or food blender. 50 decibels is like a conversation at home and zero decibels is silence. So zero is silence, 50 is normal conversation, 100 is motorcycle right next to you. And so, you know, going down by 50 uh, or up by 50 where you you become that much more sensitive is is pretty remarkable. Um, yeah, so that's interesting that someone has actually said, well, let's let's use the tools of statistics and measure this. And they found, you know, yeah, this isn't just coincidence. Now, I don't think we just have to do this kind of way. We can also just kind of use some common sense reasoning. So, you know, cancer is a tricky one because it does sometimes go into remission that that's hard to predict. But there are some conditions that, you know, are just known not to be, not to go away. Um, and so if we see those things being healed and in the context of prayer and not otherwise, you know, I think we may not be able to do a statistical test with a P value, but I think we can make a common sense test that, you know, there's something going on here that's more than just coincidence. Right. Absolutely. And then the third one, which is kind of connected to the second one a little bit, isn't it? Not quite. So the, 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 the second one says this would have happened anyway, mm -hmm. just because of the natural course of events. Okay. The, thir the third one is that it's psychosomatic. So psychosomatic, psycho mind, somatic body. It's a mind body connection. So this says there's something statistically significant, but it's not caused. So it says that there's something and it's statistically significant, but it says the cause isn't supernatural. It's a mind body thing. So, you know, everybody knows about the placebo effect, mm -hmm. you know, certain things can go away or become better during hypnosis. And so it's, it's very clear that this is a real thing. And it's something we should take seriously as a possibility in a lot of cases is what you believe in your mind can actually affect your physiology. Um, the question is, how far can we press this? You know, does it explain everything? Mm -hmm. So this is the, the power of positive thinking. And this is where, um, you, you know, I, I've, I, I've, I've, as a pastor who visits people in a hospital, um, doctors like it when, when you come and pray with people, even if they don't believe this at, at all. And one of the common things I've, I've heard from them is that prayer has actually uh, been shown statistically to, to help with healing, um, but they go right to this one. Um, and they say, it doesn't matter what you're praying to. It matters is that you actually have hope in something. And, and for us, that's not a rational explanation of God. That's not an apologetic, but it is sort of that connection to, well, this is, this is psychosomatic. Right. And so it's kind of a way to say, you know, I have a scientific natural explanation where I can say, yes, something happened. It's statistically significant, but I don't need to invoke any kind of spirits for it. You know, the, the brain is, is, is the, is behind it all. 
And, you know, I think this is something that you have to take seriously, and I'd honestly like to see more research about how far you can press this. Um, but I think there are a couple of ways you can reason about it to show that it doesn't work in all cases. You know, you hear about cases of infants being healed in ways that are pretty spectacular. Uh, you know, it, presumably an infant isn't aware of the prayer, doesn't have the cognition to associate prayer with the possibility of healing. You know, so I think I think psychosomatic gets harder in those kinds of cases. And I've, you know, there's one case I think we talked about um, last time where um, it actually goes back to Heidi and Roland Baker. And there was a girl named Albertina who was 20 months old and her eyes were completely white from cataracts. And right. during prayer, the eyes changed colors from white to gray to dark brown. And then she could see her mother for the first time. So, I mean, I think in these cases, it's harder to press the psychosomatic explanation all the way. Another scenario is when you have someone who is defiant or skeptical. So someone goes into a prayer meeting and they're like, I defy the Christian God and then they're healed. I've I've read that kind of thing happening. And there's another, you know, account from Keener, maybe not quite as um astounding, but it, it kind of gets at the idea where in 1975 there was a woman in the Philippines named Kapeng who had previously experienced prayer for long-term blindness and hearing, but there was no effect. And so she kept declaring, there is no God. Finally, she allowed prayer and this time was instantly healed of all the conditions. And then because of this, the lady who was healed and many others in the village become Christians. Um, maybe not as strong a counterexample because, you know, she might've wanted it to work, you know, even though she said there was no God, that could have been kind of her being discouraged. And she's like, okay, fine, give it one more chance. Right. But when you have, you know, there are a lot of these accounts that surround missionaries going into places where the gospel's never been heard of, and then mass conversions follow. And so, you know, it's suggestive that maybe the psychosomatic isn't as strong. Um, but I think infants, again, are probably, you know, one of the stronger cases for ruling this out. And again, you know, it's one thing to say it could be psychosomatic. It's another thing to show a study where you have actually achieved those results. You know, a hypothetical cause is different from a demonstrated cause. And so if someone says, you know, blindness gets healed by hypnosis, you know, show me the study. You know, I'm actually curious about that one. So I think this is something where I'd like to see more research, but I think there are a lot of cases that kind of intuitively say this can't be pressed all the way to explain everything. Again, it's it's the all or nothing fallacy. Exactly. Exactly. It's awesome. And the and the fourth one I think is is this the hardest to deal with because it's not concrete. Um, sometimes you'll say, hear people say, well, science doesn't have an explanation yet, but mm -hmm. one day it will. Mm -hmm. And this is tricky because they're not pointing to something you can disprove. They're just saying, well, you know, one day we'll have it. So how do you prove or disprove that? Right. And, and so you can, that's one of those cases where sort of looking back doesn't necessarily let you look forward. So they used to say, this is the, the God of the gaps, um, that, that um, we used to say it rained because God was crying. And that, though that was his teardrops hitting the earth because he's so big. And now that we understand how clouds work, we, we know better than that. And, and so obviously then looking forward, we, one day we'll be able to disprove everything else. Um, and you're right in a sense that there were places where we just simply ascribe things to the divine that we couldn't scientifically explain. But for us, they're not always so distinct. We have a God who works through means. And, and so uh, uh, God actually is behind both the sunshine and the rain. The scriptures attest to this. There's a normal method for this. Um, but one does not necessarily negate the other. Um, when it comes, though, to looking forward, we can't simply always write it off. One day we'll understand it. That's just a blind statement of faith, too. It's just a faith in a different, well, different religion. Uh, yeah, it is. I think that's I think that's the key is it's it's a faith statement. You're saying I believe science can explain everything. Um, now, what you said about looking forward and looking back, I think is the is one way to get at this because you know looking back, we see there are a lot of gaps. You know, it's called God of the gaps is the argument. There are a lot of gaps that we used to say that's where God fills that in because science can't. And then when science fills that in, we think, oh, maybe we don't need God. Um, so one thing you can ask, though, is are the gaps getting bigger or smaller in certain things? Um, and so, 
you know, when we talked about the case for a creator, we talked about certain areas where as science learns more about certain topics, the gaps are actually getting bigger. And so I think this shows, you know, maybe maybe science isn't the be all end all to explain everything with natural causes. So, um, you know, we talked about a number of prominent scientists and philosophers who believe in a creator because of this kind of evidence, you know, things like the complexity of DNA um, or the fine tuning of the universe, these kinds of things. But, um, you know, interestingly enough, there's this idea that, you know, in evolution, that if you just try things enough times, eventually you'll get the outcome you want. You know, it's kind of like roll the dice as many times as you want till you get the outcome you want. But interestingly enough, the theory of evolution only works if you already have life that is able to go through reproduction. And so the interesting thing is how did that you get that life? And science, as far as I know, has no way to explain this. And a lot of people have pointed out that that gap, the beginning of life from non-life is actually getting bigger. The more we know about how complex the information is in DNA and just the complexity of a DNA molecule and the chances of that coming about, and then not just DNA, but all the cellular machinery around a single cell. You know, it was one thing in Darwin's day when People didn't have all the knowledge of the biochemistry that had to be exactly right for a cell to live and reproduce. But it's another thing today when we know all this and scientists try to recreate life from non-life in a lab. And as far as I know, it's it hasn't been particularly successful. So if scientists who know kind of what, what the recipe should be can't do this in a lab, the chance of it happening in a in a random bog somewhere, I think is hard, especially, you know, Hugh Ross, we talked about the Christian astrophysicist, he looks at the odds of there being even one planet that is able to support life. And it's actually, by some calculations, very, very low. And so maybe we don't have that many trials, you know, rolls of the dice to get the outcome we want. And so when you put all this stuff together, I think you can make, make the case that some of the gaps are actually getting really big the more we know about modern science. And that kind of shakes this idea that science will one day explain everything. Right. It, it's actually kind of fun to, to sort of see how many sort of more fanciful and almost scientific uh, science sci-fi uh, explanations come for this. And so we recognize statistically it's getting harder and harder to let this stuff just sort of fall into place coincidentally. And so now we need multiverses. So that now not only do we need a, a near infinite amount of time, we, we need a now infinite amount of universes to even conceive that this could have happened without a creator. Yeah, that, that's a topic unto itself. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, do we have any evidence of these multiverses? Or is this, you know, science of the gaps, you know, where we say, well, there's a gap, so I'm going to fill it with some scientific theory that I can't test, you know, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I, I think it's something, you know, it's worth acknowledging, yeah, we can't fill every gap with the God explanation. But I think that doesn't mean that we can't be open to it. And in some cases that it might not be the best explanation. Again, it's the all or nothing. Right. Kind of and so we, we can go through each one of these individually. Um, and we, we kind of were talking beforehand too. sort of the, the, the reality is, um, as you, you go through your life, we're not saying what's going on has to be a miracle, but we're also what's going, saying what's going on can't be. What we are saying though is apply all four of these to the resurrection. To, to the fact that Jesus died and three days later rose again. Yeah, so um, the, something that a careful listener might realize is that I've given some examples where each one of these possible explanations doesn't work, but I haven't given a single example where for that same example, all four of them fail. And that's something I'd like to actually see more research on. I think when you study the multitude of cases and you see how astounding they are, I think it's compelling, but I'd like to see more research to kind of get into this from more of a, uh, how do we explain this perspective? But the interesting thing is the resurrection is one of the cases where it's very easy to rule out all the natural explanations. And it's actually, I have this book here, um, Did the Resurrection Happen? It's edited by David Baggett. Um, it's a conversa conversation between Gary Habermas and Anthony Flew. Gary Habermas is 
probably the world's leading expert on the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, and Antony Flew was one of the most um, prominent atheist philosophers of the 20th century who, near the end of his life, came to the conclusion that God exists. He wasn't a Christian, though, um, but Gary Habermas in this conversation said, you know, what do you think about the resurrection? And it's interesting that Antony Flew said, of all the miracles out there and all the religions, the resurrection has the strongest case supporting that it was actually a miracle, which is interesting because, you know, he even talks about Roman Catholic miracles not being as strong. And we have Roman Catholic miracles of our generation that are very clearly documented. So it's interesting that even though this was 2000 years ago, somebody as smart and skeptical as Anthony Flew says, well, this is actually the best, the best um, attested miracle. And so I think that's where we're going to have to go ultimately is to the resurrection. And we're going to have to look at, first of all, what is the data? And then how do we explain the data? And we, and you do this process of elimination where you kind of can go through all the possible natural explanations and rule them out. So I guess that can be a preview of things to come. Awesome. David, uh, thank you so much for joining us and, uh, sharing all of this, this wonderful stuff to think about. Yep. It's fun. Hey, have a good one. Okay, you too.